Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Kids in Outer Space. Today we have Kenji Jasper. He is the author of the Los Angeles Times dark bestseller, Dark, and the critically acclaimed memoir, The House on Childress Street. His work has appeared in Essence, Vibe, Aussie.com, and on National Public Radio. His short story, A Moment of Clarity at the Waffle House, was nominated for a 2018 Edgar award from the Mystery Writers of America. So thank you for coming on the show, Kenji. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I have to say this book reminds me of, I want to say, Walter Mosley meets Quentin Tarantino meets Kenji Jasper. That's, that's, <laughs> that's very good. That's that's very good. I you know I would I would throw a little Octavia Butler in there, kind of sort of you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Like a bit of J.K. Rowling, but generally yeah. <laughs> well, I would say I want to give you something. I want to give you something. So I'm I mix it up in there. So I mean I I you know it, it's I. There were some points of it where I was kind of sad, but I'm going to move on from that and I'm going to talk about that later. Okay. Your prior novel, Dark, was classified as thug noir. Now, as far as the genre, maybe people would put this in urban noir, but I felt people might miss, if people kind of put it in that category, people might miss your broader and more um, complex themes. Um, but what do you have to say about that? Well, you know, I'm I'm an English major. I'm a you know from Morehouse College, man. I think what I tried to do was to create um, a literary story in an urban world. You know, growing up in in Washington D.C., I saw a lot of things on the street that I wasn't necessarily a part of. I understood them. I learned them. I knew the rules. But you know, I was a smart kid. I was a gifted and talented kid. There were a lot of things that I steered away from or. I might not have directly been a part of guys I knew were mm -hmm. uh, people I knew were, I mean, you know, gunshots accented my life fights on trains. Every, I, you know, the nineties were a violent time. And I think I incorporated that into what I, I thought were of as literature for my generation. I think white America and, you know, sort of a, a, li a very liberal critique audience sort of called it thug noir because Thug was a very popular term in hip hop at that time. Um, I don't think they missed anything by it. I think it was sort of an attempt to sort of be hip. But uh, <laughs> I was, you know, sort of being a journalist by trade, I was just kind of taking snapshots of the world that I saw. Mm -hmm. And I was telling a story that was about a young man, which I felt like any black person, you know, growing up in black America could understand and identify with. Mm hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just, this is a thing. It's like, you know, noir is about people who have conflict, about people kind of involved in a kind of a, a complicated things. And I, I just, I don't see like how, you know, it's Pollyanna when the when the protagonist is white. So why did yours get called thug? I'll move on from that. But okay. <laughs> like, what the hell? Anyway, you know, I, I think about um, Amari Baraka's um, 1974 essay on black arts, um, the, uh, on black, um, the black arts movement avant-garde writer, Henry Dumas. Um, Baraka notes that Dumas was able to write about ancient mysteries that were simultaneously relevant to the present day. This idea that the past resurfaces to haunt the present day is crucial to Afro surrealism. And I really felt that your book had a real Afro surrealism feel to it. Like it reminds me of the past, but it reminds me of now, it reminds me of the future. What do you think about that? Well, I think when I was working on it, I mean, the book takes place both in 2005 and um, about 15 years later in 2020. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a look at capturing a place in time in my own 20s and early 30s in Best Eye Brooklyn and what I saw there and sort of a sort of a, a Best Eye on the very edges of when before it was sort of flood or gentrification completely kind of flooded in to make it what it is today. And sort of how you had, you know, the underworld had a very strong and visible presence. And, you know, um, whether it was alcohol, whether it was weed, was all kinds of sort of self-medication. The protagonist kind of has a stream of consciousness journey. You know, there's, and he's in a world where aura and metaphysics and all those things are very much strong parts of day-to-day of -day reality so that the way that he sees things in a world where kind of having this sort of mystic Jedi, yogi, um, 
Buddhist kind of take on things is not only normal for him in the world that he's a part of, but um, even, you know, there's sort of ranking classifications for auras, you know, and everyone's aura has a different color and does different things. There are mostly regular folks, but there are people who can walk through walls. There are people who can deflect bullets. There are people who uh, can do all kinds of things with their auras. And I kind of took that sort of fact and added that as maybe like, you know, commandment number 11 in this particular <laughs> universe and sort of moving around in, you know, with that as a rule, had characters behave perfectly normal. Hey, have a shot, roll blunt, you know, um, be heartbroken, meet someone new, uh, you know, there are a number of different, you know, criminal heists that take place in the book and character, uh, you know, plans heists. He's kind of a, a strategist in that way. And so, I think it was kind of a gumbo of its own design. I kind of like said, I'm just going to throw everything in here that I want and I like and I love. And, you know, I think the world is going to really dig what I'm doing. Well, I think, you know, that's the thing I think that I really loved about this. And this is something that I loved about Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and I bring that up because I'm from Los Angeles. But because he when he, when he did his movies, it reminded me of my of home. When I read this book, it reminded me of a black urban life that exists, that existed, but it seems to somehow be disappearing. It seems so kind of like normal and, and ordinary, but yet it's disappearing. What inspired this tale? Oh, one more thing I want to say. Okay. It also reminds me of the beat generation like in this weird way, this kind of like stream of consciousness of your writing, it seems very like beat, like, I mean, Allen Ginsberg, Kerouac, I mean, did that have any influence? Is that also, I'm just, just throwing uh, it out uh, there. A, a little bit, uh, a couple different things. That, I was a big fan of the Children on Adventure novels mm -hmm. in the 80s, they were really mm -hmm. popular. And those were all written in the second person. And I think the third thing was, was that uh, uh, a writer friend of mine, Nick Tashis, uh, wrote this book called Cut Numbers. And there's a there's a section in it that I love that's sort of about like this very sort of uh, this drinking binge like this it's like this 15 20 page drinking binge through all of New York and um, as I and I think I wanted to sort of do something similar of you have a guy who's literally living out his last days in New York but he doesn't know that they're going to be his last days so he makes a note of all this terrain all the scenery and all these individuals he comes in contact with. And you really get a sense of his world not having a full idea that this may be the he thinks this is the last time he's going to be in this world for the rest of his life. That, of course, ends up not necessarily being true. But um, I'm a real sucker for scenery and very cinematic imagery. Um, and I think that living in not only Bed-Stuy, but later Lemert Park um, mm -hmm. and other parts of South L.A., uh, there is a disappearance of kind of, you know, African-American bohemian existence in the city. You know, it's kind of found itself being farmed out to the burbs, farmed into small communities, farmed into other places. But it's very real for all of us that either grew up with it or have still embraced it in a larger way. I think where, whereas it was a movement that was relegated to one place, one time, one coffee house, one block, you know, like in LA, you could say that well, it's Esuan, it's Zaras, and it's, you know, uh, that certain part of Crenshaw just past, you know, the mall, or in New York, it was, you know, the Chocolate Bar or Brooklyn Moon Cafe on Fulton Street or all those things. And I think the time and place where it is a part of town, you know, is moving away from us. And it's become more about of a state of mind that you learn how to practice and embrace wherever you are. Mm -hmm. so, so what, what inspired this tale? tale? Uh, the the tale tell started out with a short story I wrote in 2005 called Thursday, which was sort of about a guy who was planning a heist to get the money to try to uh, try to take his girlfriend to Brazil as a way to try to win her back. And um, and I wrote it sort of under the gun and I sort of created all these interesting characters. And I was thinking, I really need to come back to these people because they were in a neighborhood that I knew really well. And as I started, came back to it and, you know, when I was going to make it into a novel, I had written all these other passages kind of in the same voice with the same character. 
And I kind of threw those things um, into the book and sort of made it kind of a meditation on a young man at a certain point of his life. And then later on that same man, you know, at a different point in his life, trying to figure out who he is and where he's going and to embrace his gifts despite the disappointments that he's faced along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, something I thought was really interesting is that this kind of reminds me of German expressionism in regards to the, like, like the films, not the, some, like, like kind of like uh, Orson Welles, like, like Otto Primager. And what I mean by that is that you feel the city, like you, I can see what DC looks like when you write about it. I can see what Brooklyn looks like when you write about it. And now with gentrification, is this an archiving or is this a telling of the present? You know what I mean? Like what, what's going on there? Well, I'll, I'll say this. It was, a, it was a telling of my present. You know, mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of, I've done a lot of walking, you know, not only for exercise, but just kind of sit to clear my head and think. And as I walk, I kind of map the terrain in my head. Um, another author who did this a lot was Richard Wright about Chicago, mm -hmm. South Side, you know, during, you know, Native Son, The Stranger, all of it. I mean, The Outside, not The Stranger. That's Camus. Um, and I wanted to sort of, I think, I kind of did want to do a 21st century version of that to kind of capture the places I knew and what I remember, but I didn't think of it from a historical sense. I think it was kind of like, well, hey, this is where my head is right now, only now so that the book is done and I real and, and so many places have changed and that Brooklyn isn't what it is anymore and this DC isn't what it is anymore. You know, um, I realized how important it is to document those things beyond photographs or YouTube or what have you so that you know, someone who is a millennial and the generations following the millennials can read it and have a sense of how the world really was. I mean, that's what literature is supposed to do. Um, I'm sure, we have 400 channels of cable and films and video games and VR technology, but there's something to be said for the first person narrative and being able to picture it for yourself using your own mind and your own sense of visualization. And you're correct. And the thing is that I feel like they're trying to, and by they, I mean white people, are trying to write us out of existence. Like, they'll say places are, you know, like you, you go to Newark, New Jersey, and they're like, oh, look, these are, you know, it's, it's becoming gentrified, but it's still black people there. Brooklyn, when I went, you know, being from Los Angeles, you know, there are a lot less black people in Los Angeles than there are in like on the East Coast. And I was kind of shocked. I'm like, oh, wow, there's so many black people here. We're still here. And so do you feel like your work is even more important now because of that? I, you know, I was having a conversation with, um, with Kalisha Buchanan, another very decorated author out of Chicago earlier today. And I, I feel like my work is probably more important now, you know, than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when, you know, my stuff first started coming out because, um, the cities are so different. You know, I think then, we were all sort of talking about the same things. I think now the need to sort of remember and understand what the black urban experience, inner city experience is important because there is less and less and less of the black inner city, you know? I mean, Cabrini Green in Chicago is now, you know, luxury condominiums from what I understand. Um, Lamarck Park and the neighborhoods around Los Angeles, particularly after uh, the developments with the train is shrinking, is becoming more and more expensive. Um, you know, Brooklyn, everyone knows about is just black folks have been priced out in New Jersey and everywhere else. So it's, it's, it, it's no different than Walter Mosley's work documenting uh, Central Avenue in Los Angeles in the 40s, going into the 50s, 60s, the transformation those neighborhoods took on. It's just important for us to do this now. I mean, I've in the last couple of years that I've been uh, in this neighborhood in Petworth in D.C., I've watched it white and ridiculously. I've literally watched an almost all black block, you know, be mostly white in just a couple of years. Uh, and when property value and real estate, you know, is the big thing that's popping in a socioeconomic sense in this country, you're just going to have, you know, more and more of that because folks want luxury. You know, they want convenience. If the houses are worth something, that means, you know, the shopping centers, the restaurants, everything around it gets the, an upgrade public transportation 
private transportation, now that you got Uber and Lyft being so successful, um, you want to be able to travel wherever it is you want to go and come back and, you know, quote unquote, not worrying about having an element that's going to mug you or that, you know, in a, in a sad sense, you know, use a manufacturer's coupon in your local CVS or, you know, barbecue, you know, just all the things that, that, you know, the news is sort of, you know, zeroed in on right now, you know, as a reflection of the haves and the have nots and, uh, you know, economic and social stratification is sort of happening all over again. It's a new segregation, you know, the rules aren't based upon race, but, um, far too often, you know, what, what we make and how we live is often determined by prejudice, by discrimination, uh, by our, by lack of education, by education, by so many different factors that you kind of have, a, you know, parable of the sower, I'll tell you, Burley, you kind of have this world within this big wall, you know, where successful folks live and everyone else who's outside of it, either trying to find a way in or trying to survive. No, I mean, that's, and I, and I love how you talked about, you know, a lot of these private so-called sharing economies is not so much about sharing, but about blocking yourself off from the community that which you live. So thank you for saying that. Cause I mean, I think so many times we, we, we think we know that in our head, but we have to say it out loud because we think people know, Oh, everybody knows, but it's not written down. So then if we don't ever say it, you know, 10 years passes and then it became people, well, why do we have this? Because, you know, we, we needed it and not because of racism. Well, and, but I, it, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, I was having a conversation with someone. This is a hot topic. I, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, black folks of a certain age are having these conversations all over the place. And one of the things I was saying to someone, they were like, yeah, man, well, you know, Georgia Avenue isn't what it used to be. And, you know, I miss it when it was this. I was like, yeah, but back in the day, you couldn't get Thai food on the corner, you know, three blocks from your house. There would not be a Thai restaurant here, you know. There wouldn't be Korean fried chicken, you know. The the pizza delivery man might not they might not deliver pizza to your house. You might still mm-hmm. have the bulletproof glass carry out, you know, with the recycled grease and you know one or two other things. But it's good. Transformation is a good thing. You know what the focus should be. You know, in the black community, is us getting our piece of that. You know, of us having the success and the trappings and the accoutrements that we deserve in our communities and, you know, pooling our resources to bring that money to where we are to spend our own money differently. And, you know, to make sure that we are not on the outside, if we're on the outside of their wall, you know, then we got to figure out ways to build our own. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's that simple. It's, it has to stop being so much about, well, we don't have what they have. And it needs to be more about well, what is it that we have and what don't we have that we really need to be focused on having. Hey, $300 J's is great. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But if your kicks are fresh, you know, but your credit is garbage, you know, or uh, only place you've been to is Miami or All-Star Weekend. You've never been outside the country, you know, or, you know, you've never eaten anywhere, you know, you've never eaten at a certain kind of restaurant or had a certain kind of experience, maybe those are the things that can focus you to expand your network and your outlook and help you to get that money you really look for. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question. Is Kango urban black America or is it, or is he you? (laughs) Um, Well, Kango is both. I think at one point in time I was urban black America, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I'd spent a long time working in the music industry, you know, so I was very sort of plugged into where the streets were. But I think Kanga was my idea of sort of this warped idea of how I didn't want myself to be, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be like this sort of, you know, approaching functional alcoholic kind of pie guy that was really talented and didn't really like push his limits or maximize his abilities or see the big picture. And I think that in aiming to sort of parody and clown myself, you know, <laughs> I, um, I created a guy that's, that's sort of an alternate version of myself, but he came to the levels of awakening that I feel like I am, you know, a little bit later on than I did. Mm-hmm. And so it's, he's kind of, 
and I won't say a cautionary tale, but he's a reminder to Generation X that you can still level up. You can still get there. You know, if you had it, you can get it again. I mean, sure, you know, you if you if you were a relay runner, you you ran a marathon, or you 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 were Olympic hopeful, you know, and you were twenty one. Okay, you might not necessarily be able to do that same thing at fifty, you know, but mm -hmm. In terms of your dreams, your goals, your aspirations, your outlook, taking care of yourself, um, and applying your skills, you know, to to folks and to situations that matter, you can still definitely do that. And that's like, and you can still fall in love, and you can still be happy. And those are the underlying lessons in Notion, Notion Avenue. And it's it's the first book in a series, so um, the the story continues. It moves on. It moves on. Well, something I noticed about the book, and I don't know if this is on purpose, but I noticed that you explain how a lot of people got their wealth from their parents. It was inherited. It was more like a, a privilege. Like people, I was able to start this restaurant because I got this house. She's able to start this hair salon because her mother gave her money. Is that a sort of middle finger to respectability politics? Or was that just something you just wrote? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I read too much into that. No, no, no it, it, I, it wasn't about respectability politics as much as I think that um, black folks, to me, you know, we get things all kinds of other ways. We take mm -hmm. a lot of us to get, to have to build the foundations we need. We take the back door, we take the side door. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. um, the hustler in the neighborhood might, you know, bankroll the boxing program or, you know, might might help a couple people who down here want to sell fireworks on 4th of July to open up their little stand so they can help do feed their baby a little better or whatever it is. You know, um, local business owners who might have a little bit of a shady background, you know, might have a card game where some folks make some money that funnels things into this. I think my whole point was that there are all kinds of doorways, all kinds of pathways, all kinds of intersections. And the way to get things isn't always the completely legit go to a bank and get a loan, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a way when what we know is that all of us aren't able to do that. Most of us aren't able to do that. You know, predatory loans, discriminatory, discriminatory practices, these things are real in banking. You know, I mean, you know, uh, so many institutions are coming under fire for that right now. Um, and with identity theft and hacking, and all those things going on in terms of privacy and data, you get it whichever way you can get it, you know, and just mm -hmm. make sure, you know, you cover your tail on the back end so that you don't get caught up in doing that. Mm -hmm. Somebody has like a, like a comment. It says, I like the focus on identifying what the community needs for development as opposed to development for the developer's needs. So I guess it's kind of like saying like, you know, what you, when you were, I guess this person is stating um, they appreciate your idea of like, oh, the community can decide what it wants for itself. It can also benefit from. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that what we have to do because wealth is so stratified is we have to really take care of the places where we live. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts with knowing our neighbors, but knowing, you know, we have a mutual interest, interest in taking care of, where this place is, you know, we need to we need to take care of where our kids go to school, and, in, and we need to take care of where we eat or what's available in our grocery stores. All those things require organization. We need to vote. You know, when we start to do all those things, you know, whether or not we're a part of the one percent or not, we have to make our voices heard. Whether that's through art, whether that's through economics, whether that's through religion, we all have a part to play in that. Well, I thought it was something that was really interesting. Like in Los Angeles, we have one of the most wealthy black populations in the United States, but we didn't have a high school that we could go to that was a public high school. And I was just, I thought that was really interesting. Like we really don't have a public high school that we could send our kids to. We have to go to a private school because, you know, we're the, we're supposed to, we always kind of brag about that. Baldwin Hills, Ladera Heights, they're very wealthy, but we don't have a high school. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, I've heard a lot about um, a lot about those problems in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, do you see this as being for the big screen? Like, who would you like to direct it? And I'd also like to throw my hat in the ring to help write the screenplay. If you need that, I'm I'm here. But <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. I'm actually you know actually working on the script already. If I were okay. to 
if I were to choose a director, that's that that's that's tough. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of who in my mind right now. I mean, I like Seath Man a lot. He does a mm-hmm. lot of television. Uh, his brother went to Morehouse. Um, um, and every all my you know, I'm trying. I'm just trying to think under under the gun. Uh, <laughs> Anthony, Anthony Hemingway. Yeah. Um, um, God, 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 God. Uh, a guy who's a he's a he's a really good cinematographer who should be a director named Hans Charles. Uh, he mm-hmm. shot uh, the Thirteenth, uh, Ava DuVernay's documentary. Um, I'm trying to. There's so many, so many. I mean, there's Ava, but you know, I I, I can't afford Ava, man. You know, <laughs> like the roof, you know um, uh, but you know, I there's a there's an actor in my mind at least, um, Dorian Missick, who is married to Simone Missick, who's a uh, Misty Knight on uh, who plays Misty Knight on Luke Cage, who was a really, really talented actor who was doing some things. Mm-hmm. I would love for him to star in it. Um, there's a number of different uh, Jay Ellis, who's on Insecure now, uh, another mm-hmm. person who I think could be kind of a cool lead for young Kango. Um, mm-hmm. And like I said, older Kango is like, you know, late 30s, 40s. So there's some actors who we know all too well that could definitely be in the running too. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, 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 I'm, I've thought about that a lot, like, you know. Well, that's why I feel sometimes. If sometimes you read a book, you're like, "This should be a movie." It's just like this is this can't just be here. It's gotta be like I gotta see a visual because I, I mean, I, I could see the, I could see the film as I was reading it. So, what are your thoughts about real life, real life Brooklyn and real life DC? And me being a West Coaster, I thought something was really interesting that you called Brooklyn the Caramel City. I was like, "Oh, I've never heard that." No, 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 DC is Caramel City. Uh, oh, I thought- no, see, D- DC used to be called Chocolate City. That's what it was known as. Okay. okay. Like, uh, we had a black mayor, um, cops. It was an all black city, and so Caramel City is the idea that it's gentrified, so there's white mixed in. So it's you know, um, I, technically you could argue parts of Brooklyn being the same thing. You know, yeah. you could say Best Size of Caramel City now. Um, Fort Greene most definitely is. If it's not a latte city. Uh, I just like, never heard that term, so it was just like so interesting. Like I was like, oh, like I, I even actually wrote a screenplay with that same title. Um, but it, I, I think it, it was my idea that sort of when you talk about black folks, we always talk chocolate, we talk fudge, we talk about dark chocolate. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. you know, I'm not so dark, so you know, it's like <laughs> not black. So you know, the, the, Carol- that's a, the blackish city. That's like us. That's <laughs> blackish. You know, it's not, that's not bad either. So I mean that that's kind of that's kind of sort of where it came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really good. We're, we're almost gonna wrap it up, but I feel like oh, I want to ask more questions. So why do you write? I know it's a hard question. I'm like, like, why do you write? Why do you do what you do? I'm like the guy that tells the story. So what mm-hmm. I mean by that is, is that whether I'm your friend, whether I'm an observer, whether I'm someone that hears about it after the fact, you no. Know, Someone has to be there to document things that are going down, you know, uh, because whether it becomes rumor, whether it becomes fact, someone has to tell a story. And I think because I was always in the stories, whether it was listening to my mama and my grandma in the kitchen or whether it was listening to guys or seeing things happen on the street, writing it down was always important because I wanted to share that story with someone else. So. I'm always driven by that first and sensed by my ridiculous uh, and very explorative sense of imagination. Mm -hmm. So do you feel your job as a writer has an impact on urban planning in regards to black space? Maybe you've never thought about this question, but I'm just throwing it out there. (laughs) It's interesting. My, my, my baby sister is, uh, is an urban planner. She just sort of, you know, she just got her first gig and I, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. Uh, but in this book, you know, I, I do some really wild and crazy things with architecture uh, in, in the not too far future, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely think that at some point we will want space again, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. space and land are this thing that we're running out of in, in the city, you know? And as we desire more space and more room to breathe and, you know, to reconnect with nature almost in a kind of transcendental sort of a way, we may find ourselves moving away from big skyscrapers and everything else and trying to find open spaces 
you know, to breathe a little more ox oxygen, to grow our own food, to, you know, do all those kinds of things. You know, I think that's within the realm of possibility. So I think what I want the reader to do is to think, well, hey, if you don't like my future, if you don't like the future I'm painting, I dare you to do something to alter your trajectory so you don't end up in it. If you love it, hey, you know, envision the apartment you want to move into. You know? <laughs> Imagine the restaurant where you want to eat on that block. But it's the reader's choice to decide where the story goes I, you know, after my writing ends and where it was before my writing started. So I always sort of leave that up to the reader. Mm -hmm. And the final question is, what is your favorite black space? My favorite black that, space. That can mean anything. Keep it clean. That's okay. <laughs> Interesting, man. Like, uh, huh. I would say, I would say the corners. You no, know, because the corners are where anything can happen, you know, and the corners are where you get the perfect vantage point of everything else that is happening on the block, you know. So people fall in love on the corners, people get shot on the corners, people spill their candy on the corners, people find a hundred dollar bill on the corners. Everything happens at the corners and the intersections. So that's definitely my favorite place. And even in Ocean Avenue, there are three characters that uh, they live on the corners. They represent all those different levels of possibility. I have to say, I think that's like the best answer ever. Like, I mean, I, I love the fact, no, cause I, I, I love, I love the corner. I love the street vendor. I love like that kind of like our public space, our place making that now becomes like this grant making opportunity, but we've been doing this the whole time. <laughs> So it's really bizarre, but it's great that you kind of can see it like, yeah, the corner is like a great space. So where, so when is your book coming out? Like this is his book and his book is awesome. So yeah. when's the book coming out? It comes out uh, August 28th. Uh, if right now, you know, if you're in New York or if you're in Washington, D.C., we got uh, book events, book launch events happening. Check Eventbrite. Uh, we're working on doing something in Chicago and Atlanta, uh, in LA, where you are, and um, you know some other places too. Possibly, 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 probably Memphis as well. So we got a lot of different things going on. So um, check Eventbrite because it'll all be posted there, and um, check me on Instagram. I'm um, at Kenji Jasper on Instagram. I'm at Kenji Jasper on Twitter, and I'm just plain old Kenji Jasper on Facebook. So um, hit me up and see what's going on. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming to Black Kids in Our Space. We we really appreciate it you coming on. We also really enjoyed your book. So you know we're looking forward um, to, to, to 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 you know watching the success of this. Um, just because like I didn't expect to be sad when I read this, <laughs> but I was sad because I missed what's not here anymore well, in some okay. places. Well, I'll put it to you this way. You know, like I said, it's a series. You know, mm -hmm. so what makes you sad there? You know, there may be joy and exhilaration and hope and desire, you know, in the next volume coming soon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Take oh, care. We got one more comment from Peter Woods. Thank you for good work. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Black kids in outer space. Black kids in outer space. Black kids in outer space. Urban planning, walking, bicycling, and more in our space.